Good morning, everybody. You know, there was so much talking going on. I was wondering if anybody realized there was something else happening in the room. <laughs> but it's good. I love when everybody talks. It's good. So welcome to Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. I'm Pastor T, Pastor Tracy. So glad you're with us today. We welcome you. And our purpose statement here is loving God and loving others fearlessly. So this morning, this is what's on my heart. You know, I was thinking about Advent. And by the way, we're taking a pause in our sermons from John, and we're doing some Advent sermons for, for till Christmas. And, you know, I was thinking today, you know, Emmanuel, God with us, right? Just the beauty of this, God in the flesh, coming to us to rescue us. And Advent is a season where we pause and we reflect and we listen and we, and we seek God's face and just slow ourselves down, which is ironic because in this season, right, how many of us feel like we have sped up? Right? Right? So this is what's on my heart um, to read, which is Isaiah 9. And it says this. It says, For to us a child is born, and to us a son is given. You know, the sweetness of this is, you know, we read that and go, For to, unto us a child is born. But just pause for a minute. To me, to us, to this world, a child was born. To this world, to us, a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. So this is what I'm going to invite us to do today. How do you need God today in this moment? How do you need God? And I'm going to invite you to stand when you need God in this way. Who needs God to be wonderful? Yeah. Who needs God to be a counselor? Who needs God to be a mighty God? Yeah. Who needs God to be an everlasting father and mother? Who needs God to be both parent? And who needs God to be a prince of peace? So this is what I want us to do. Whatever name you stood up on, can we pause in this moment and can we breathe that into ourselves? It's so interesting to me that God, in Genesis, the story is told that God breathed into us. And it's like in this very base need that we have of God is the very base need that we need in ourselves to be able to survive and live. Because if we stop breathing, we ain't here no more. So I want us to, whatever word that is, if you need God to be wonderful, breathe that in right now. Breathe in God's wonderfulness. If you need God to be a counselor, breathe that in right now. God is a counselor. If you need God, I got to look at the verse. If you need God to be a mighty God, breathe God in as that mighty God who steps into what you need. If you need God to be an everlasting mother or father, breathe that in right now. And if you need God to be your Prince of Peace this morning, breathe that in. So, Lord, we say yes to all of these things, and we agree with you that you are all of these things for our life now, right here, right now. 
And we thank you so much for this morning, Lord. And we thank you for your breath. And the invitation this morning, church, is that as we go into worship, don't lose this, this call to worship. Whatever name you needed today, hold on to that. Grab a hold of who God is for you in this moment. Let's worship.
I know I tipped my hand a little bit there. It's a, it's a little bit fascinating. <laughs> it's a little bit stressful. <laughs> fascinating was going to be the wrong word. It's a little bit stressful trying to lead worship when you're sick, but sometimes it's... I remember, uh, I remember years ago watching, uh, uh, watching our friend uh, Sandy Chadwick coming up here and talking about exactly that, of just as an act of obedience, just sometimes when it's when it's your when, when it's your turn and you're called sometimes just getting up uh, getting up itself is just an is just an act of obedience and sometimes we just have to come and, and just lay that down so that's what we're here to do this morning So God, we lay, we lay every preconceived notion about what we do here for worship right before you. God, we leave it at your throne. Because that's all we care about. that your name is worshiped this morning. Everything else is ancillary. The ridiculous part of my brain this morning, and I'm sorry, I will shut up soon, is, uh, you know, tends to go to the, uh, the, scripture says if I if I don't praise the Lord then the rocks will cry out and I've got the drummer singing behind me this morning so that should tell you everything that we need help and I'm expecting your help so join us and you give life you are love you bring light to the darkness. You give hope. You restore every heart that is broken. And great
Coming after me. Repeat that with me. Coming after me. And all of my troubles, all my trials, all my disappointments and celebrations, God comes after me. No matter where I'm at, what I'm going through, the challenges that the world wants to throw at me, there is an overcoming spirit better than God that comes after me to welcome me into God's kingdom, to God's rest, God's purpose for my life, coming after me. Is that good to you? It's good. Here at Cornerstone, we believe in both the organized and the, I'll say, organic move of God in everything that we do. And so from time to time, we have members that will come and will counsel with the elders and say, hey, is this a word for the body? And we think we have one of those this moment, this morning. So I'm going to ask Dana to come up and share that word with you. So during worship, I had like this really intense emotion um, that there are people in the room that are going through the wilderness right now. And what I mean by the wilderness is you can't sense God. 
can't feel God. Maybe you haven't heard from God in a while, and it's discouraging. It's disappointing. It's, what am I doing here? What is happening in my life? Are you even real? I've been through that season myself, and I just keep, this, this picture of the three wise men just keeps coming back to me, where they went on this months and months long journey through desert and through all sorts of things, following nothing but the inkling that this star meant something. And they had no idea what it meant. They just went. And I can't even imagine the stuff they, they faced on this journey, on camels or donkeys or whatever it was they traveled on. But it brought them to the Savior. So I just want to encourage you. What I sense God saying is, I'm with you. Even in this wilderness that you're in, this season, whatever it is, I am with you. There's no shadow I won't light up. There's no wall I won't kick down. I am with you. Thank you. Dave, I know you're pushing. Would you push with me a little bit longer? Could you put up on the screen the, the parts of the song, that, that end part that we were just singing? And I want you to sing those together. For those that are in the wilderness, we are going to come alongside of you and sing the praise with you. That there's no shadow you won't light up, no mountain you won't climb up. For what? For me. Dave, praise team. Because you don't want me to sing. There's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, lie you won't tear down, coming after me. There's no shadow. You know, as I uh, reflect on the words of this song, a few things come to mind. It shows us the things we see versus the thing that God sees. We see the mountains. We see the lies. We see the walls. Because we're human. 
But what does an almighty God see? He sees lies for lies. Walls that are boundaries for those that are bound to earth. But what does an unbounded, all-powerful God see? He sees the things that was poured into you at your birth. God sees the things that he created you to be from the beginning. And he has not given up on making sure those occurs in your life. I said a couple of weeks ago, um, I saw it in your faces as I looked up into the audience that you've already won. You still are looking at the walls, but you've already won. Don't get disappointed because of the process that you're going through because you've already have won this life that we're living in this time in this moment it's just the process already won I don't know if you needed that but I did and I thank you all for singing your song in praise and worship you may have just hummed it, but keep on humming. One day you'll get the courage to say the words out loud. Maybe just a whisper in the beginning. But what I used to like about the church I grew up in is you could sing off key. And that was my specialty. But nobody cared. Because they knew who you were singing to. Right? Ah, such a sweet moment. For those that have joined it online, hopefully you've been able to do the same. That you've been able to understand what you see versus what God sees. And understanding that you have already won as well. I want to Move us forward slowly. I'm going to ask the service to come and join me as we go into uh, our offering, part of our worship. Online, uh, there'll be some instructions on the different ways to give. We thank you all for that and taking the time and the effort to support us here in this ministry and what we are trying to do. And what is that? Of reaching people in the 21st century of where they live. Of doing as the Acts Church did, which was what? Search the scriptures of what was the traditions and what did Jesus Christ mean to us now? So in the first century, that looked a certain way. And that's what you see written literally in the Bible. But there is a very big task that we have today in the 21st century to do the same. And that is to go out to the hedges and the highways to tell about someone named Jesus that was here, and that is here, to change your life. To make an impact in your life both now, today, and forevermore. And if you support that same mission, going out to each and every soul that is living on this earth, meeting them where they are, and understanding that there is a Savior for them as well, we ask that you support our ministry here today. That's why we do this, to reach others that don't have that understanding yet, right? So those of you online, thank you for what you've done. Those of you in the room, we thank you for what you've done. We ask that you continue to be with us. So let me pray for you. Dear God, we thank you for your people. We thank you for all that they've done, all that they're comfortable doing. And I ask that you speak with them and that you be with them and that whatever they decide to give, 
that you'd bless them in their household. Let there be no lack within their household and allow them to continue to follow your guide. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So do we have any children in the house? Wave at me a little bit, the children. So Christine is at the back of the room. I invite any of the children that, um, to go and meet with her for Kingdom's Kid, where they can learn the scriptures and about God on their level. Most of the things you see of me today were formed at that age, where I could ask questions, no matter how simplistic or simple they were, and somebody answered. And so I so appreciate the teachers uh, that take the time to teach our children about God. And for those of you who have that same calling, we ask that uh, you sign up and be a part of that team of instructing our children. It's such an important job. Amen. And so, my last task this morning is to bring the speaker. And I always pause to take a moment to show gratitude to the speaker. And here's the reason I do this. Two reasons. One, I don't want to be accused of giving your flowers after you've gone. I want to give you your flowers now, right? And I also know as a speaker that sometimes when you are preparing to speak on a Sunday morning, the week prior to that is um, some curse words that you're not supposed to say in church. <laughs> and at times, it's literally that week I'm going, God, really? You're going to let this happen this week? This week? So... I want to take the time and show love, care for our elder Kevin, for what he is about to bring to you that would enlighten and inspire your heart for the week, and to let you know we appreciate and thank you for the week I know you've gone through. <laughs> welcome him, welcome him as he comes. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, as he said, my name is Kevin. I am one of the elders here. It's a privilege to serve as one of the elders here at Cornerstone. Um, and it's good to be with all of you this morning. I'm grateful that each of you are here and that we can have this space together. Anytime I'm in front of the communion table, I'm, I'm also always reminded that this time and space that we share together is just as sweet as the sacraments in which we'll partake later. Yeah. This is what Jesus saw. Yeah. This is the joy that was set before him. Yeah. This is why he could endure the cross, yeah. each of us. So even before, not to get ahead of myself, but just seeing the elements here, I can't help but think of all of us and think of this time together. So I pray you join me and even in partaking in their sweetness now. And I'm also grateful that when, uh, that all we have is all we need. I was thinking of what Dave was sharing about leading without a voice. Like how do you lead worship when you feel like you don't have your voice? 
But then I'm reminded that with Jesus, all we have is all we need. We always have enough. Each of us, plus Jesus, it's always enough. There's enough. We are enough. You are enough. Dave, you are enough. This is enough. Jesus and us, together, we are enough. So yes, as Pastor Tracy mentioned, I am here to interrupt your regularly scheduled program of going verse by verse through the book of John for the month of December. Between you and me, I think we might be starting to run out of chapters, and that's making her a little nervous. So that's just a working theory, but I think there may be some merit there. And also, as she said, it is Advent, which actually started last Sunday. But we don't formally celebrate Advent here, so I was actually curious how many of us are even familiar with Advent? Show of hands. Yeah, well, that's a lot of you. Yeah, me too. Um, But so as not to leave the rest of us in the dark, those of us who didn't grow up with Advent, what is Advent? Go ahead and just shout it out from wherever you are, or raise your hand if you want to be called on. I can do that too, but what is Advent? Yeah. 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 I'm hearing coming, yes, Advent meaning to come, Latin. I'm hearing four weeks before Christmas. Was that what you said, Tony? The four weeks leading up to Christmas, that's also correct. I heard preparation, preparation. yeah. Making way, way. absolutely. What are some of those symbols of Advent? If you grew up with Advent, what are some of the, like, images that come to your mind? Candles, yeah. How many candles? This is a debate. There's a lot of debate on this. I hear five. I hear four. Did I hear nine? I heard a niner. Yeah. And there are different colors representing different themes. Yeah, you guys are very knowledgeable about this. What colors can you think of, of these candles? Purple, yeah. Pink, yes. White, yes. My mom and dad's church, there's a lot of debate about this because they're United Methodists, so they change pastors every so many years, and a pastor that was at their church prior to the current pastor changed the colors of the candles from purple to blue. Yes. Any, yeah, that's a, great, that's a great question and a sermon for another time. They're all still there. The candles are still blue. But yeah, and in, in Great Britain, the candles are red. All of the candles are red. So, I mean, there's some differences there, but yeah. The one that, the tradition with which I'm familiar was there were four candles set atop an evergreen wreath. Three of them were purple, one of them was pink, and then there was a white candle in the center that we called the Christ candle. So a little extra credit for those of you who love to go above and beyond, my Enneagram 3 achievers in the room. What are the meanings of the candles? Hope? What else did I hear? Love? Peace and joy. Yeah, very good. They're also known as prophets, Bethlehem, shepherds, and angels in some traditions. So now that we are all illuminated, a true story, or perhaps a truly embarrassing story, but I'm going to share it anyway. I really like Advent. I really like Advent so much that last year I wore a pair of purple dress pants on weeks one, two, and four, and I purchased a pair of salmon pink pants just to have and wear for the third Sunday of Advent. It's okay, you can laugh. Laps and applause are all accepted here. Nerd is right. I I wear it, yes. Nerd. What can I say? I feel deeply, and apparently from time to time I embody those feelings physically (laughs) in my dress pants. But all of this got me to wondering, 
Why? Why do I have such an affinity for Advent? I think because I've always been very, very busy at Christmas. Any musicians in the room? Can I get an amen? Amen. And a God bless you too, because man. Uh, I had a question for Steph, who is home with Nathaniel, but Matt, can I ask you, as department chair of the music program at the school where she teaches music, When did Steph have to make reservations for all of her concerts in order to successfully navigate the insanity that is auditorium reservations for all of her school's ensembles? It's a field of landmines. It it just is. And if you all have kids, you know you're going to concerts like every other day. Our kids have a concert on the Tuesday of Christmas week. I mean, there's just no break. Well, even before school programming ramped up, my church put on a Christmas musical every year. And the director's youngest child, she had four kids, but her youngest was my age. And so the musicals were tailored to my age group every year. As I grew up, so did the musicals. And they started when I was very young, in early elementary school, like first and second grade. And I had a strong memory and a good ear for music, and I was dramatic, or dramatically inclined. So I was often the lead in this musical. And by lead, I mean every single year. (laughs) Now, as a child who loved the arts, that was such a gift, right? But it did mean that I was very, very busy every year at this time for as long as I have had memory. On the days immediately following Thanksgiving, the aroma in my childhood home shifted suddenly from turkey and stuffing to bleach and highlighters. I know that's quite a pivot. But we would deep clean our house every year before setting up for Christmas, even down to mopping down the basement walls. So picture young Kevin, just a little shorter than I am now, (laughs) mopping away at the walls while my ever-efficient saint of a mother, Jody would spend this time helping me memorize all of my lines so I could be off book before December. This ritual is so vivid in my mind that I can see and smell those walls, that old sponge mop, and that blue highlighter right now. Middle school and high school just compounded this with the addition of all those school programs that we're all familiar with. Musicals, choirs, bands, handbell concerts, all added on top of the church. So it was a very, very busy, hectic, hustling season of the year. Now into that, enter Advent. My family, as I mentioned, had a small brass-framed, artificial evergreen adorned advent wreath that sat atop our Eden kitchen table. And we were so holy that we didn't just light the candles on Sunday. We lit them every night of the week. (laughs) We would take turns lighting those candles, leading the response of readings, reciting the prayers, and singing those Christmas hymns. There was a part for everyone at the table to participate. For me, It was an invitation to slow down. For this minute, to pause and to be present. The chaos feeling like it was suspended in time around me, like a great slow motion clip in a big budget movie. Picture the matrix only like around my childhood kitchen table. You know that moment on Christmas Eve when we're all standing around with candles lit, singing Silent Night? And the peace in that moment is almost palpable. That was the first moment every year when all of my obligations at school and church had finally, finally been satisfied. And at long last, Christmas could begin, just hours before it was over in a flurry of ripped wrapping paper, except for those moments of Advent every day. They would invite that moment of all is calm and all is bright right into the middle of my chaos. And they would sustain me through that season of chaos. 
That ring of evergreen would pull me into its life-giving orbit. Those purple and pink candles would burn so slowly for a whole season or even two or three that they would slow me down too. Advent wasn't in a hurry. And for those precious few moments each night, neither were we. This is the essence and the beauty of Advent for me. And this is the invitation of Advent to all of us, a call to gather around this circle of light and life in the very midst of the season of hibernation and growing darkness and slow down for this moment and engage with Advent's life and circle up around its light. Now, you guys know my rhythms now, so it's time to settle in, get into a comfortable position. Go ahead and move. You can move into a comfortable position. Take a nice, deep, relaxed breath, and remember that we're not in a hurry. Now, let's journey back, back to where it all started, back to the beginning, and yes, I mean that beginning, and also to John 1. You guys remember John 1. Ah, yes, I remember it like it was a brief 96 weeks ago. (laughs) And that's because it was. Now I'm going to invite you to close your eyes, if you will. Close your eyes, if you will, and enter into this darkness that was over the surface of the deep before and God said. Now listen to these words and let them take form in your mind. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. Can you see them? And the Word was God. That one's a bit trickier to see. But the Word was with God in the beginning. Through Him, all things were made. Can you see it? Creation taking form. Light. Sky. Oceans. Earth. Vegetation. Sun. Moon. Stars. Fish, birds, great creatures of the sea, every winged bird, blessing, more, large livestock, little creatures that live their lives among the ground, wild, good, dirt, breath, Adam, human, Salem, God's resemblance, Blessing, provision, original goodness. Rest. Can you see it? Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Let's open our eyes. I could read just those five verses every Sunday and be satisfied deep, deep down in my soul. In the beginning, a clear link to the genesis of Genesis. And in this beginning of beginnings was the word, logos. Now, there are two Greek words for word in the New Testament. There's logos and rhema. And uh, John uses logos here, but he uses rhema later in John 6.63, saying, It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh provides no benefit. The rhema that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. Rhema as spirit. Rhema is also often ascribed to words from God's mouth, like in Matthew 4.4, 4, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every rhema that proceeds from the mouth of God. Or in Romans 10.17, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the rhema of God. While logos is more often interpreted as a written word or thought, 
It's also considered a masculine form of this, or synonym for Sophia, the Greek personification of wisdom. <laughs> and when used with the definite article here in John, it is often understood as the divine expression. Isn't that beautiful? So while rhema represents the unseen word, spirit, or speech, logos is the visible word. So we have this personified divine expression present with God in the beginning. And this divine expression also straight up being God was and with. And through this divine expression, all creation was spoken into existence. Through that word, that logos, all that we read that God said in the creation in Genesis was this logos present and at the same time being God. So it's no wonder that in this divine expression that created all life as we know it was life, zoe, and phos, life and light. They're woven into the fabric of our very being from the beginning. They were spoken into us by and through the divine expression who is incarnating the creation into being. But the incarnation didn't stop there. John 1:14. And this is it. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That word for flesh is sarx. Flesh, carnal, human, soft, messy. Yes, this articulate word became sarxy, fleshy. The incarnational word, the word of in the beginning, and the word of it is finished, that word, skenaos, with us. That's the word for dwelt here, skenao. And it means to tabernacle, to abide, to dwell. Now, we aren't as familiar with that word anymore, tabernacle. A tabernacle is a movable habitation, typically of light construction, like a tent. So what is John getting at here? He makes clear in verse 14 that this word he has been speaking about is Jesus and was with God and was God, and he was in the beginning. But why does that matter? Why does it matter that he's like a tabernacle, like a tent? Why does it matter that he's soft? Why does it matter that he's movable? Well, because we are sarxy. And yes, I made that word up, and I've used it twice now. <laughs> Fleshy, carnal, human. And let's be honest, we get scared. Often about not being in control. And we also fear that which we don't personally understand. If something is outside of our experience, our default tends to be fear. So we spend a lot of time and energy trying to understand to nail it all down. And so did the people in the Bible. Because above all, they were people too. They weren't bad people, just people people who were peopling. So they struggled to trust solely in a knowledge of good and evil that was held through the relationship with God who walked with them in the garden in the cool of the day, rather than a word that they could hold directly. And so they grasped for a word of understanding they could hold and hoard within themselves. And they struggled to trust in a word that was literal firelight through the darkness of night in the exodus out of Egypt, and instead turned to words carved in stone, and then added lots and lots and lots more words in an attempt to nail it all down, parsing out every nuance of what those words meant, really meant, really, really, really meant. And haven't we done that? Don't we do that? Clearly the Bible says, or clearly the Bible doesn't, or thoughts of how enlightened we are, or by our defensiveness to prove any opinion that we hold. We want to be understood, and even more so, we want to be right. We want to win. We want absolute assurance that we can confirm and control rather than trust. 
lots of people later, but we aren't that different than the people in the garden. Knowledge, logos of our own, logos that we can pin down, immovable. But something breaks when love becomes law, when judges become kings, when tents become temples, when what was meant to move is cemented, when what was meant as someone to come with is swapped for somewhere you must go or can't go, when the living word is exchanged for mere words, words that are static and stoic, you can't dance with a statue, and we weren't meant to, and this is why this all matters. Jesus is the word that became Sarxy. And Jesus is the word that skenaos with us, tabernacles with us. He showed up in the flesh and he came with a sleeping bag and a bag of trail mix, ready for adventure. And fun fact, adventure comes from the same root word as advent. Ad meaning to, veneer meaning to come, ad veneer meaning to come, which became adventurous, which means about to happen, which became adventure, which is that which is about to happen. And I learned that while hiking with my good friend Matt Kistler this fall. Thanks, Matt, for the words and the wisdom and the walking. And because we were always meant to journey with the word just like that, like a day with a friend hiking at Hibernia, All of John's beautiful poetry here is pointing to this, how holy, holy, and how holy human Jesus is, was and with again. He is God and he is with us, Emmanuel. He became Sarxy so he could skenao with us, so he could be closer to us, abide with us, go where we go. So I want to take a minute and look back through some of the images we've seen of Jesus doing this. Do you remember seeing how Jesus moved towards the disciples? In those days, Hebrew boys went to to temple school. Those that made the cut continued on to become Pharisees. And those who didn't make the cut learned a trade like shepherding, carpentry, fishing, Yet those unchosen by the temple were the very ones chosen by the one who tabernacled. From the first proclamation to the shepherds camping themselves on the hills outside Bethlehem, all the way to the 12 disciples who followed him. And what about when he moved toward the Samaritan woman at the well? Do you remember that one? The written word strictly forbade it on multiple levels, but that didn't stop the word. She couldn't step foot in the temple, so the tabernacle stepped foot into her world. The word Jesus, the capital W word, always makes a way. And did you see when he moved toward the paralytic man, a man who himself could not move? And where was that man stuck? At the pool of Bethesda, which is surrounded by five covered colonnades. And it's believed that John calls the number five out so specifically here because it was representative of the five books of the law of the Torah. And what happens when love becomes law? Something breaks. And it's usually a person or a people. But what did love do? He moved toward him and healed him. And when did he do it? On the Sabbath. I'm pretty sure their word had some pretty specific things to say about that. And what did the word say about that? He said, pick up your mat and walk. And when pressed about working on the Sabbath, he threw God right under the bus along with him and said, my father's always working, just as I too am working. 
clarifying that Jesus isn't a different word than the Father. Remember, the word was God. So they both said, pick up your mat and walk. And since a mat is a place of rest, they might as well have said, pick up your Sabbath rest and take it with you. Can you see it? Can you see the word moving? Can you see the visible logos clarifying what the invisible rhema has been saying all along? When the hand of law was drawn back and ready to cast stones, love stretched down and drew in the sand and found a way to bring life to a woman standing before a death sentence. He is a way to every one of us. After moving towards each of the disciples to wash their feet, even Judas's, Thomas asked just a couple weeks ago, how can we know the way? Thomas, how can we know the way? The way. And Jesus answers, and in my mind he is smiling, and says, I am the way. I am the way to you. I am the way to you. I am the way to you. I am the way to you in the back and you over on the side and to those back in the kitchen that are making cinnamon roll Sunday a reality and to those outside these walls that are not going to smell the sweet smell of those cinnamon rolls in a few minutes. You'll notice there are no stick figures in my sermon today. Thank you. But that's because we are all the stick figures today. I can hear Jesus saying this with his life. I am the way to those who didn't make the cut, the discounted and the discredited. I am the way to the outcast among outcasts in Samaria, at the well in the noonday sun. I am the way when you feel trapped by systems of oppression and stones are drawn. Beloved, I am familiar with the fringe. I have a tent pitched there tonight, and my trail mix is always open to you. I am the way when you feel broken, maybe even by the church. And I am the way on a Monday as much as I am the way on a Sunday. I am the Prince of Peace. I am the Sabbath. What if all along the Sabbath rest wasn't what we did or didn't do, but whom we did or didn't do it with? relationship. It is my experience that experience itself is the only thing that can meaningfully move the needle in our lives, meaning the thing that can really bring about true change. That is the power of centered set, where a bounded set has a list of what you must and can never do. Centered set says, spend time with Emmanuel. Spend time with God with us. The focus isn't on what you do. If it is, we've already lost. We can never will ourselves to be perfect. Trust me, I tried. It is whom you do it with. Because even repentance comes from their kindness It doesn't come from a list of rules. It doesn't come from communal shame, even though this world has definitely tried that on me, and I'm sure on a lot of you. But spending time with God with us, with their kindness and their love, because I don't know about you, but that's what I feel when I'm in their presence. Love, acceptance, belonging, and that, that changes you. That moves the needle. How many of you have been burned by a church? I'm seeing some with two hands in the air, waving them back and forth. So why are we here? Why are we still here? When asked why Advent means so much to him, Rob Bell replied, because cynicism is the new religion of our world. Whatever it is, this religion teaches that it isn't as good as it seems. It will let you down. It will betray you. That institution, that church, that politician, that authority figure, they will all let you down. Whatever you do, don't get your hopes up. 
Whatever you think it is, whatever it appears to be, it will burn you. Just give it time. He continues. Advent confronts this corrosion of the heart with the insistence that God has not abandoned the world. Hope is real and something is coming. Advent charges into the temple of cynicism with a whip of hope, overturning the tables of despair, driving out the priests of that jaded cult, announcing there's a new day and it's not like the one that came before it. The not yet will be worth it. Advent whispers in the dark. So if you find yourself today in a situation of being left out or overlooked like the disciples, or being left out because of how you looked, or who you love, or where you live, like the Samaritan woman at the well, have hope. And if you've been hurt by the law like the paralytic man or the woman Christ saved from stoning, which is all I will ever call her, have hope. Even in the darkest night, the dark is not dark to Jesus, even when it's dark at five o'clock. For the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not and never will overcome it. That's one reason we light candles at Advent. Candles for hope and peace and joy and love. One final activity, because Advent is about slowing down and being mindful in the waiting. I want to invite you into a personal prophetic exercise. Pastor Tracy has introduced us to this, and uh, it feels especially poignant to me this morning. So one last time, if you are comfortable to do so, I invite you to close your eyes with me. Take a deep breath and come into your body. Feel your weight in the chair. Feel it supporting you. Feel your feet on the ground. And feel your breath coming in and going out. Now take a second breath and focus inward into your heart, soul space. We're going to ask God some questions now. And if you, like me, sometimes struggle to hear God's word of love for you, I invite you to think of someone you love and ask God what their word is for them and then dare to accept those words for yourself. Ask, what is your word of hope for me today? If it feels quiet and dark, even maybe visualize yourself lighting that first candle of Advent, the candle of hope, and bringing that light, the light that's coming the light that's here, the visual representation of what already is into that space with you. What is your word of hope for me today? Now ask, God, what is your word of peace for me today? Light that second candle. Bring the light into the darkness with you. What is your word of joy for me today, Jesus? What is your word of joy for me today? And lastly, God, what is your word of love for me today?
Now take a third deep breath and come into a space of gratitude. A space more illuminated by light. Offer that light back. Just like we were singing this morning, it's your breath in our lungs, the very breath that we're using to praise you with. It comes from you and we turn it back. And then when you're ready, open your eyes. Would anyone be brave enough to share anything that you may have heard of any of those? A word of hope, peace, joy, love. Lighten up. Lighten up. Lighten up. To laugh. Yes, to. I thought I had an image of God kind of saying to us, this is something aside, focusing on something very important but important, and the other things aside that are very important. Nice. That, that image reminds me of Centered Set. Once you've seen the Prince of Peace and you focus on him, the other things can start to feel relative to that, like they're falling away. Yeah, I see that. Dave? See how I am moving. Ted. I'm right in the season of having to raise, need to raise a substantial funds to open our nonprofit in June. And I'm feeling that pressure. <coughs> and I felt God was saying, you just have to have faith. I'm walking with you. I'm walking with you. He's with you. It feels good not to be alone in those things that feel big. Jenna. I just kept saying, Jesus is here. He's there. He is there. Nice. Always in the business. Walk. Always. Know that he's there. Yeah. He's always with us. Emmanuel. Yeah. Anyone else? It's okay if it's not, but if there is, you're certainly welcome. Yeah, Gretchen. Can you say that once more? It won't always be like this. Stay in. Anything you choose will be fine. Oh, that's a good one. Be there and trust the joyful moments. You heard me say amen to that one. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I heard the words of hope. I got you, too. No, no, no. Jesus, don't leave you. We're bringing you to the earth. And for peace, be sure. Mm. And for love, I just see God going crash. Amen. I love his presence in each of those. Anyone else? I'm trying an experiment where if I move towards you, do you talk more?
No. It's working. Yes, wisdom. I felt like it was the, it was like peace, like God just saying, trust me, like I will bring all the pieces together for you. Like, so for peace, P-E-A-C-E, God was saying, trust me, I will bring all the pieces together. Yeah. That's a relief, isn't it? This is why it's good to share. Because these are word, this is the same God. This is the same word for all of us. So if one of these things you hear and your soul is like, yeah, take that as a word for you. This is one of the ways through which God speaks to us, through each other. Ashley, did you have one too? I wasn't even standing over here. And then for joy, I got love. And then you said word of love. And it was just kind of like God was anticipating the words. I don't know. Like it was, it was weird how they kind of built on top of each other. And like there was just almost like this anticipation of the word that I'm going to give you is the word that you are to have. Yeah. God was anticipating what each of the next prompts was going to be for Ashley, even in the moment. So when she was in the first word, God was already speaking to her about peace. When God, when I said a word of peace, God was already speaking a word to her of joy. And in joy, God was already speaking a word of love. Because God is all of these things. He, he's the whole entanglement of it all. He's Sarxy right along with us. There's that word again. If I say it enough, it'll make its way into a dictionary. That's the kind of clout we have here at Cornerstone Christian Fellowship. <laughs> Miriam in Webster's is watching and listening. <laughs> Anyone else? Thank you all for sharing. And uh, keep listening. I know this season is cold. I know it's dark, darker every day, still for another two, three weeks. But there's light in the darkness. And there's a turn coming. It might be in the horizon. It's the point at, after, beyond which we cannot see. But it's also the same point at which light breaks. It's the same point at which dawn breaks. So if it is feeling dark, do not worry Hang in there. God is with us in our darkness. And December 22nd is coming, and that will be a little brighter than December 21st. And each day forward after that will be a little brighter. And I pray that for us both physically and spiritually. Yeah, thank you. All right, we're going to move into a time of communion. I'll move this out of the way. You're fine. Miriam and Webster's is watching, but they just care about words. So you can move. Jesus moved, we can move. All is well. Even on that night that we remember through the sacrament of communion, Jesus was moving. He moved to wash the disciples' feet. He moved to break the bread and offer the bread to each of us. This is my body, broken and given for you. And then he took the cup of the new covenant. It's like the cup of the Lagos saying, this is what the Rhema has always been saying all along. This is my cup of love for you, my blood shed for you. 
And when you do this, do it in remembrance of me. Enter into that word that I can't remember, the paraturesis dance. Paracoresis dance. So yes, Christ extends this table to all of us. At Cornerstone Christian Fellowship, we believe that the table is a place for every one of us. All of us are invited to God's table. There is room, there is enough, and there's an invitation to you. So as we move into this time of communion, you can ask the servers, those who are helping out, to come up. So we invite you, should, I guess, come up the center aisle and then we can split. Just be careful of the cameras and the cords. But yeah, come enter in. Come take a seat at this table. Come enter into this gift of brokenness and life poured out back for you.
understand and sing that. just want us all for a moment to close our eyes. Can we pause in this moment Even in this moment here, they are dancing through this room. What that word parachoresis means is it's the movement, the dance, the flow, the ebb. The closest they could come to defining the three in one was a movement. Imagine with me God's presence moving and flowing, intertwining all of us in this space. God with us. And imagine with me God's presence flowing and intertwining and moving in this moment through our loved ones. Even whether or not they believe, the invitation still stands for them to see. And imagine with me them flowing through this world down streets, into homes, in Washington, in our politics, among our enemies, among our loved ones. That is God with us, the all-inclusive, all-loving God.
That's Advent. Pause this week. Pause and breathe them in. Pause throughout the day. Pause in your offices and imagine God flowing through these offices. In our jobs, in our homes, while we're driving in our cars, when we're in the grocery store. Imagine God's presence flowing through, inviting people to come. That's Emmanuel, God with us. Thank you, Lord. So sweet. Kevin, thank you wherever you are. I don't see you. Such a, so beautiful. So beautiful. So a few things this morning. Um, food pantry is, is open after the service out in the great room. Second thing is free soup Fridays. God bless Val Jean and Cindy and Janice and Dion and my Lord. Such a good, good time. And it's even so, it's like a drive through this year. So it's even easier. So please come by and, and they always need people to make soup. So if you're really good at making soup, even if you're not, but you, people can eat it. Oh, you do. Okay. You have enough soup. So you're off the hook. All right. And once again, halle, hallelujah. It is cinnamon roll Sunday. Woohoo! Shar, shar, God bless you. And so this is what you need to do. Go out, grab a cinnamon roll, and then go right over there to Sophia's art show. She has an art show that she's doing. It looks so good, so pretty. So amazing. So it looks fabulous over there. And also, I wanted to let everybody know, you know, Christmas is a beautiful time, but it's also a time that can be difficult when we have lost loved ones this year or when we have had difficult moments this year. We have a service of solace on December 21st. If you have suffered loss this year, and sometimes Yes, it definitely, we want that service of solace for those who have passed away. But sometimes you just simply suffered loss this year. So this is the service to come to. It is a lovely service. It is a moment in a beautiful, difficult time to pause and, and recognize our loss. So we invite you to come to that December 21st. That's a Wednesday night at 7. So let's all stand for the benediction. I am so grateful, God, that you came and dwelt among us. I know that I and many others in this room, we cannot do our lives without you. We need you. May we pause throughout this week, throughout this day, as we go throughout our lives and remember you and see you in the space in which we're at. May we share your love with others around us and breathe that life into them. May we be your walking Advent calendars, Advent, sorry, candles. And Lord, may you pour out graciously in and through us and out into this world. Pray your blessing over each one in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Don't forget to go. Eat, go. Eat, go go. Thank you, everybody. Oh, visitor cards. If you are visiting us, would you please put your visitor cards in the box in the back? Visitors, thank you.